My name is Anita Harriet, president of the Fine Art Group, and we have the absolute pleasure of being able to discuss two of my favorite things. Um, an incredible collection that's rare to the market, that um, it's extremely eclectic and very interesting um, from both a scholarly and a market perspective, and a focus on single learner sales. Um, so today we have some very distinguished guests. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, Olivia, I'd love everyone to introduce themselves. So Saren, um, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And I'm just really honored to be here to talk to you about a remarkable person, a remarkable collection, and also what this collection is doing to give back to the world. I am a stage four cancer survivor. I am the curator of the Sydney Rothberg collection. I grew up with it. I love it. And I can't wait for you guys to explore it. But I also started a nonprofit and so much of my life is about giving back. And that's what I hope this collection can do over the next month. Thank you so much, Saren. Al, Alistair, could you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alistair Nichol. Welcome from a very snowy Philadelphia. I'm the <laughs> deputy chairman and head of fine art at Freeman's Heinemann. And if you recognize my voice, it's entirely possible you've been watching Antique Roadshow over the last 25 years or so. So delighted to be here today. Thanks so much, Alistair. Colleen Boyle, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Colleen Boyle. I work alongside with Anita Harriet as the managing director at the Fine Art Group, and I'm responsible for business development as well as philanthropic strategy. And I'm looking forward to sharing some insights with you today about how clients are using their art and other types of collectibles towards charitable impact. Thank you so much. Can we have the next slide, please? So, Saren, um, I know what it's like to grow up with the collection. I grew up with the collection of my grandfather's, and every day I think about it. Um, tell me what it was like to grow up with this collection um, throughout your life and your relationship to your dad and the art. I'm just taking in a minute to take in the pictures. Uh, as you can see, they're making me emotional. I lost my dad 16 years ago, um, but it, I just, these pictures are like getting a big hug. I didn't realize they would choke me up this much. Um, he was a remarkable human being. My dad became a dad at 40 and chose to be a single father, which is incredible for those years. I mean, I grew up in the 60s. Okay, this is the part where you're all in shock and you go, oh, you look too young to be born in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good filter, people. It's a good light filter. Anyway, um, he chose to be a single dad. And what was so incredible was that he hung the beautiful works that you're going to see. And hopefully you'll see them online and hopefully you'll come to Philadelphia and see the 242 works live and in person uh, during the free exhibition, but he hung them at child height. So as a toddler, instead of having to look up to the adult world to engage and interact with some of the most beautiful paintings in the world, I got to grow up at my height level just asking questions. And that's why this exhibition that we've toured all over is so important because we want you to kind of get the experience that I had living with these pieces. And we always make the joke around here that these aren't paintings, these are like my siblings. And so you're getting to meet my family because that's how integral these works were to my father. Uh, he grew up very humbly, started in Philadelphia and then went to World War II at 18. He was a soldier walking down the street and somebody said, hey, soldier. And he went over and they showed him a beautiful impressionist priceless work of art. And they actually said to him, I will sell this to you for a pack of cigarettes. Now he didn't smoke, so he didn't have cigarettes, but he knew that they were looted either from a museum or from a home. So he wasn't going to acquire it. But what it did was just create a fire in him to try to understand what was it that he saw on the streets of Paris. And so when he came back to Philadelphia, 
which I was raised in Philadelphia too. It, he just loved this city, diehard Philadelphian. He went to the Philadelphia Free Library and he collected every book that he could get to sit at a desk in the research area because they wouldn't let you check them out. Our books were too expensive. And week after week, month after month, year after year, he would devour these art books. And because he had a photographic memory and was a savant, he memorized them. And so as he was at University of Pennsylvania on the GI Bill, he actually acquired his first piece at Freeman's. So this is a very full circle moment for our family. I actually was taken there to buy my first piece when I was not even in kindergarten with him and then my own piece as, as a tween. But he really just became the most curious art collector ever. And as we start to unfold the pieces that you're going to see, you're going to see that he had a remarkable eye, that he was ahead of his time. He collected untold amounts of female artists, very diverse artists. He collected movements before they were movements. And so I just am so excited that I not only get to introduce you to these incredible works with these amazing people who are helping me do that, but that I get to introduce you to this extraordinary, curious, bold, single dad that loved me and then loved his art second. So please let's just let's just unfold this. Yeah, thanks so much. Next, please. Okay. Oh, Darren, take us oh, through this. This is uh, again, it, it's making me emotional because <clears throat> this was one of the first phrases I ever remember hearing out of my father's mouth. And not only to me, but to anybody that entered our home or stood in a museum or at an auction or at a gallery. My dad wanted to know, what did you see? What do you see when you look at a work of art? He would never impose his views. He always felt that he could learn something by asking you, what do you see? And it wasn't just for the art expert. He felt that even the untrained eye, the uneducated person could reveal and show him things that he never ever saw in one of his works or in another work. So when I decided that I was ready to really give this collection piece by piece to the world, and this is a huge undertaking, these first two sales are 242 pieces. I felt that unless I honored his passion and curiosity to know what people really saw and what connected to their heart and what did they not like and what resonated, what would they never forget or what did they see for the first time looking at a painting or of a new artist, he would want to know that. And therefore, I also want to know. So we have this unbelievable interactive component to these exhibitions where you can actually look at any work in this collection and you can go online or use the QR code and tell me, what do you see? And I know he's looking down from heaven and that he's getting all your responses real time. So please no matter if you just see one painting, let me know what you see and be part of this legacy that I'm creating that will then go on to support one of my passions in the charity world as a stage four cancer survivor with blessedly no visible disease. I've devoted my life to really improving the quality of life of other people living with cancer, survivors and their caregivers. And I do that through Beating Cancer Daily, which is a 365 day podcast, but many other research studies and programs that I hope will make a big impact on the lives of people living with cancer. So tell me what you see. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you, Saren. Okay, Al, Alistair, um, going over to you. So yep. we have this idea of what you see. <clears throat> Tell us what you see. <laughs> what are, what excites you about this collection? 
Well, where do you start? Um, there's so much that's exciting about the collection. It's funny just seeing the images that hang there that would have been in Sid Rothberg's house. But I remember going there and it's so familiar. It makes one think of the barns immediately, but we'll, we'll come back to that later. What excites me? Well, amazing quality. There's a real range and depth to the collection. But I have to say, as an auction person, and I, I wouldn't be alone here, it's the freshness of the material to the market that has got people really exciting. Many of these works haven't been seen for, I don't know, 30 to 50 years, even longer than that. And he was buying at auction for many, many years. As Saren mentioned, he, he started off at Freeman's in Philadelphia. And it was funny for me, it, it became quite personal when I found a painting, it was by John Graham. I'd moved to the States in 1997, and I was working in an auction house in New York at that point. And I remember selling this work, and, and here it was again in the warehouse, looking back at me. So that, that was exciting. So really what we have here is an auction of rediscovered treasures. And it's very rare that you get a trove like this coming to the market. And so I'm excited, but there's also great excitement both nationally and internationally. We're getting calls and inquiries from all around the world, which is a real testimony to the, the quality of the collection. Thanks so much. Can you go to the next one, please? Now, let's do a deeper dive into the specific works to some of the threads that connect the, the different works in the collection. And this is where you have your art historical eye and, and your market eye. So Al, start taking us through this collection, please. So uh, this was a collector, Sir Rothberg, with you know, an incredibly inquiring mind. As uh, Sarah mentioned, he was, he was a voracious reader, but his taste was not really just for the ordinary. He gravitated towards works by artists that revealed their thought processes as, as they developed their career and their work and inflection points, if you will. And often these subjects can be really quite challenging. He was an ardent Francophile and many of the works uh, you know, we mentioned earlier that he was in France during the war. And like many of the post-war post generation, he immersed himself in the philosophy of existentialism. And I think some of that spilled over to the imagery that we see in the paintings, I think in the red oil, for example, on, on the right there. Um, but let's not forget, he, was, he loved the good things in life too. There, there's a real playfulness as well about him. And I think that comes across in, in, in the works too. And finally, as was said, he was truly a diehard Philadelphian. And that comes out. But I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Thank you. And Saren, is there anything specific you want to tell us about this Redon? I've heard you mention it before. It's a fascinating <laughs> okay. story. Can you share? I can talk about every painting. I I can't wait to point something out in the Redon, but I want to just say this teapot, this Renoir teapot is so incredible because it's one of the last works that he did in his life. And for you, if you don't know, that Renoir was a ceramics painter, a humble beginning as a ceramics painter. So here is someone later in life, looking back at their beginnings and paying respect and homage. And my father loved this Renoir. It has such quiet elegance, and it also has a luminosity in person that really makes you walk into it as if you're looking at a teapot. So that's one of my baby siblings. Like I love this piece so much. The, the Rodon is so fun because we have so many conversations about it. At first, people are like, oh, it's a nude. But if you actually look deep into this painting, follow the gaze, right? And look into the burst. Do you see the profile of the figure in that burst? Can you see the, like the shadow blackout of that figure. So we, uh, I did not remember that at first. And Raphael, one of the incredible art experts at Freeman at first wasn't blown away by this painting. And now it is, it is his most favorite painting because as you look, you see more and more. And just harkening back to Alistair's sense, my father was so playful. We, it was, 
a place where you could eat dessert first. If I promised to eat my whole meal, he would let me have a piece of cake first or chocolate first. And so that you're going to see in some of the paintings, just that incredible childlike spirit. And this was one of the little mysteries that he really loved. And if you go deeper, you see the, uh, the extraordinary craftsmanship that it took to be able to paint what you actually can find as you dig deeper and deeper through this painting. Thank you so much. Can, can I just you. chime in there? Those, yeah. those are two of the, the staff favorites, I have to say. We, we love these paintings. And in fact, we made the, the Renoir lot one to kick off the sales. It's a good one to start off with. Thank you. Next, please. Okay, Al, let's go a little bit deeper. And, and, and this definitely shows the diversity of the collection. I'm so impressed you had a Bob Thompson. Can you take us a little bit through some of the, the highlights? Well, yeah, so as you say, there's a Bob Thompson there who back in the day, nobody really knew. Um, and it really shows that his collecting was very prescient. He was, he was ahead of the curve. He bought this 30 years ago. And Bob Thompson was an African-American artist who died when he was just 28. And it's only recently that he's begun to be recognized in the market together with other artists of color. So as Sarah had mentioned earlier, her father was very interested in artists with, of diversity, let's say. And so, yeah, it was impressive that he bought this when he did. Nobody else There's was doing that. There's actually two. There, There's there two are two. Indeed. Yeah, there are two. The and the other one is uh, very different. Provincetown, yeah. And, and the Soutine, tell us a little bit. It's a beautiful painting. Um, tell us a little bit about this work. Well, Soutine is one of my favorite painters. And of course, I, I wanted to include this painting because it, it taps into um, his love of the Barnes. I mean, Barnes went to Paris and bought about 50 works by Soutine on one buying spell. So that became the cornerstone of, of the, the collection to an extent. He was really passionate about Soutine's work. And of course, if Barnes had one, Sid had, had to have one too. And it's, it's, it's a lovely example. And there's a wonderful exhibition at the Barnes, uh, it was a few years ago now, of Soutine and de Kooning, and how Soutine had actually influenced de Kooning's work. De Kooning had gone to the barns to see Soutine's work. And of course, we'll mention there were two, I think there are two drawings by de Kooning in the sale as well. So it's, it's, it's a really nice yeah. example, but you can't underestimate how important the barns was to Sid and his collecting. He studied there, he taught there, he knew it like the back of his hand. And many of the artists in the collection like Glackens, like Jean Hugo, even the primitive painter John Kane, all feature in the Barnes collection. Well, and he also had this incredible relationship with Violet de Mazia for decades. Mm. They were, you know, incredibly close. And uh, because my dad was a single dad, he would take me to the Barnes Foundation. Children were not allowed, particularly little kids. Uh, toddlers and such. And so the fact that I was allowed in the Barnes Foundation as such a tiny one, and it was because Violet told my father and myself that it was because I was round uh, as a kid and that I looked like a Renoir, a little Renoir child or a little Mary Cassatt. And she loved that that little look was, you know, in the Barnes Foundation. And then years later, when I was just a teen, she allowed me to be a student and she did not allow underage people to be students in the Barnes Foundation. But again, I had been going there and assisting my dad when he would guest teach. And so I, I got to learn personally from Violet Demasia and the Barnes collection is not only so deeply reflected in the sale, but it is, if you saw the pictures, those were actually real photographs of our, our walls. And you could see that artists were hung as they influenced each other. And also um, as they were painting together using palettes because they were poor sharing studio space and also tribal art that influenced or culture that influenced the painters was also hung around the works of art. So it was a fascinating way, not only to study art, but to learn about society and culture and experimentation 
as Alistair said. And actually, if you're coming down to see this exhibition, stop by, see the barns, and then come over to Freeman's, and it'll be an amazing experience. Um, yeah. Next, please. Okay, so give us a little bit more insight here um, into, again, the diversity of this collection. Well, it, these are two works by women artists, and as Sarah had mentioned earlier, uh, so again, was pretty much ahead of the curve in the buying. And so a lot of the artists included in the collection are by women artists. Now, it's only recently, it's taken a long time, that women painters and artists are really being recognised on the market, both for the quality of the work, and that's being reflected in the prices as well. So the painting on the left by Alice Baber, and I'll just say, I was asked recently, we all had to record a little thing about what do you see and I can't help but look at it and see a lava lamp every time I look at that painting I see a lava lamp it's a beautiful painting he bought this as part of a job lot I think he bought it with four other paintings it was so long ago and literally until about I don't know five ten you couldn't give her work away right. and now for a larger example you know they sell for six figures and then on the right we've got a lovely earlier drawing by Lee Bonticu who again is an artist who was totally underrated for many, many years and has really come into her own recently. And so we're delighted to have these, this piece. It's a really stunning drawing. Thank you know you. what was really fun? When we had the exhibition in Chicago, this Baber was all the way at the end of the corridor. And when you walked in, there were big, big heavy hitter paintings, you know, the Renoir, the Soutine, the other one were, but I have to tell you, this Baber drew focus yeah. straight towards it. I mean, as if it were a giant. So I, I urge you to go see it in person. It is tiny, but mighty. And <laughs> is, is just ethereal and mystical and fascinating. Thank yeah, you. The, the Baber has got what we call wall power. Even for, yeah. just for 10 inch by 10 <laughs> inches is amazing. Piece. It really grabs you. Yeah. Next, next, please. So um, I really now want to talk a little bit about single owner sales um, and kind of what's the secret? This is for Al. What's the secret sauce to a single owner sale? When do you know a collection would really benefit from being a single owner sale? And I know you have some examples here, but you know, take us through that because we think it's such an important. Um, structure for a lot of sales, but I'd love to yeah. hear. Well, it's it's something that I'm, I'm pleased to say that Freeman Simon we've, we've specialized in over the years, and, and these are two examples. And obviously, the, the work has to be of a quality. It needs to be coherent mm -hmm. and hang together. And you really, it's, it's all about telling the story as well. That, that's what it's about. So on the left there, we see the collection of Dorrance Dodo Hamilton, who uh, I'm sure many people in Philadelphia would know, who is one of the Campbell Soup heiresses. And we were very honored to sell her collection from, I think, two, two different homes, in fact, uh, three homes several years ago. And it was a great success. And, and we toured, the, the Suzanne went to uh, London, it went to Park Paris, it went to Hong Kong, et cetera, et cetera. But there's nothing that gets people in our business more excited than a single owner sale, frankly. And I have to say the George Horse collection is just extraordinary because this was a little house built out on a Christmas tree farm, of all things, near Reading. And you mm. went in and it felt like if you were going into, I don't know, Tutankhamun's tomb or something. There was dust and cobwebs and all sorts of things. And then you started all and there was amazing paintings of that, both European and American. And there was only about 60 lots in the sale. It was, it was what we call white glove sale, which means we sold every lot. But what was really extraordinary is a third of the lots set new world records for the artists. And what was lovely for me was when I was in London and um, I saw one of the paintings that had been hanging out in this dusty place, hanging in the National Gallery alongside a Sura and a Monet. So it, <laughs> from small things. Um, I have to say that we bid, um, the fine art group, on behalf of our clients, we bid in both of these sales. Yeah. So as buyers, we get very, very excited about single owner sales. Um, the unique collecting appetite of the owner, the rarity of the works, and the freshness to the market. So I have to say- That's we exactly, exactly right. Them, it's the freshness to the market. Yeah. And, and it's the branding as well. 
you know, having the name attached that means something to people. I, I used to joke, you know, when we used to do country house sales in the UK, when you'd done the old masters and the silver and the third day, you'd be selling things from the attic and whatnot. There'd be things like laundry baskets and they'd be making hundreds of pounds just because of the house they came from. You could go down to the local shop and buy one for 10 bucks or whatever. But because there was a name attached, all of those things make them incredibly successful. Thank you. Can you go to the next one, please? Um, Colleen, um, I know you've worked on behalf of a lot of our clients at the Fine Art Group um, with a single owner sales strategy, um, but you also are the head of philanthropy. So it's the double whammy. Can you take us through as a case study um, the Jack Davis Library? Sure, Anita. Um, I just wanted to echo what Alistair mentioned. You know, the single owner sale, it's, it is really about telling the story. You have to keep in mind that clients collect all different types of objects, whether it's art or watches or books, and there's experiences through the collecting process. There's stories, as you heard from Saren, uh, explain her experience living with the art and how her father acquired the art. Um, and these stories are shared when you put together a structure like a single owner sale. We're seeing more and more frequently, not only a single owner sale, but a single owner sale that's tied to charitable endeavor. We like to call it selling with a purpose. And that's what happened with the Jack Davis sale. Um, the husband and wife had been married for years uh, through their journey of acquiring art and Tiffany lamps and other types of objects. They had a lot of stories and a lot of fabulous experiences. And unfortunately, his wife fell ill very rapidly and very, very unexpectedly. And the family really came together to figure out what, what were they going to do. Uh, the two heirs already had houses full of objects. And while they took a few things, they weren't able or interested in taking really an entire collection of items. But they decided they really wanted to create a legacy to honor their mother and to honor this experience, this journey she had with their father of collecting. And so we worked with Alistair and his team to put together this single owner sale where the proceeds actually went to set up a scholarship fund at the mother's alma mater. It was a fabulous outcome. Um, the, the sales estimates, actually the results of the sale were well above uh, the high estimate and all the proceeds went to a charitable endeavor that was again, very passionate for that particular family. And it's a legacy that is, is, is still in existence. We're seeing more and more of those scenarios uh, for anybody who had followed the Paul Allen sale that took place. That was the billion dollar sale that happened um, and the proceeds all went into Paul Allen's foundation, all being allocated out for various grants supporting various uh, nonprofit endeavors. So we're seeing more and more of this type of trend. And I would say, if you're lucky enough to work with uh, an auction house that will put together a catalog, which is rare now in the marketplace, um, it's a wonderful legacy. I still have my grandfather's single owner sale at Christie's catalog. I look at it all the time. I watch the pieces still go through market, um, which is a lot of fun. So having that catalog is also a wonderful way and a tribute for your family and the next generation. And just to add on to that, Anita, it's also an opportunity in the catalog to highlight the collector and the charitable impact. So usually there's a lovely bio with photos, descriptions, as well as um, where the proceeds may be allocated. Can you go to the next one, please? So as the head of philanthropy, take us through the choices a family typically has when they do are the custodians of a collection. Yeah, so really, if you think about it, there's only three three choices that can be executed during lifetime or post-testamentary. I mean, we find that clients are looking to gift items. They might gift to family members or non-charitable beneficiaries. They may donate. They may donate to an institution or directly to a charity, or they may sell with the proceeds possibly going to a nonprofit, to their donor advised fund, to their foundation, uh, or other, again, types of charitable endeavors. Those are really the three options. We highly, highly encourage families to have conversations if there are heirs. Oftentimes, it might be a hybrid approach. Part of, the, part of collections might be sold during lifetimes. Other might be sold later. But it's so important to have conversations because it could really become a burden for the heirs uh, who are the soon-to-be custodians of these assets. 
Oftentimes, the heirs are not quite as knowledgeable as the collector themselves and don't always know how to manage these types of collections. And on that note, let's roll into the next slide, please. Statistically, what we're finding is that 81% of collectors actually intend to leave their collections to their heirs. However, they really haven't taken the steps to educate their heirs on how to manage or how to sell the collection. And keep in mind, it's costly to maintain collections. Again, the heirs may not be quite as knowledgeable as the collector regarding these collections. They may not know where to sell. And it's a it's a tricky process because they could leave, you know, potentially money on the table. They may not understand that the collection could be used towards charitable impact. Um, and it's really important to have those conversations holistically within the family. Obviously, if they're not any heirs, then you really want to make sure there is a really well thought through plan for any type of collection, particularly if the intent is to leave the collection to an institution, make sure the appropriate steps have been executed to talk to the institution and to make sure that the institution is interested in accepting the donation. We're finding more and more often that is not the case. So planning conversations, very, very important around the strategy of these objects. Next slide, please. Um, Part of the benefit of a family philanthropy approach is to really strengthening the family values as well as having these communications. It over it also allows the recipients, the heirs, to overcome the challenges of, of inheriting unguided wealth. And it, and it gives families the opportunity to create a legacy. We had the opportunity to work with a family that had a really significant coin collection that the heirs just were not interested in being custodians of the coin collection. And we were able to help the family sell the coin collection and the matriarch and patriarch who are still living set up a multi-generational donor advice fund. And they use that donor advice fund as a tool to teach the heirs how to choose charities, how to choose how much money to offer to charities each year, how to become philanthropic. And they use the coin collection as a means to fund the donor advice fund because the family members, they just weren't interested in being the recipients of the coin collection. So think of it as ways to, you, it, these types of assets can really, really be used to make a difference and to support family causes as well. Next slide, please. And then lastly, just want to talk a little bit about creating legacy, which is what we're doing with this particular collection um, that Alistair and Seren have been discussing today. You know, part of the questioning you want to ask yourself and ask your families, are you interested in donating all or part of the collection to an institution? And if so, there's a process. So make sure you adhere to that. Are you interested in selling all or part of your collection and allocating proceeds to charitable endeavors, social impact investing? Are you thinking about contributing proceeds to a donor advice fund or your private foundation or possibly starting a private museum? These are all questions to explore through the process of trying to determine what to do with your collection, particularly if you're thinking of a charitable uh, impact solution. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, so Saren, back to you. Um, it's a great transition going from Colleen talking about all the choices, and I bet as you were listening to Colleen, you're like, yep, I was thinking about that. Yep, I had to make that decision. Yep, I've been a custodian and a curator. So um, tell us a little bit about how you came to having your charitable um, your charitable focus and, and how your thoughts were around this collection as it relates to that. Sure. I also, just to follow up on something that Colleen said, you don't have to be dealing with millions of dollars of collectibles to actually have these pivotal conversations or to say, start a donor advised fund. I really have seen among my peers that these conversations are not being had. And I have a really good friend high up at the IRS and I told him that I wanted to give a talk like this and I wanted to start families having these conversations. And he was so excited that we were gonna do this. We did it live in New York and it was really beautifully received, but he said, you know what? You have to do this talk and you have to put it on the internet because the IRS gets so much money because people don't have these conversations about collectibles and it could just be one you know expensive you know work of art or one expensive thing that somebody got 
at a at a flea market and it turned out to be so valuable so they actually were excited that we were giving this information to the world i grew up in a family where philanthropy and service was stressed where everything was about supporting organizations and always looking at how you could help change and meet a need that's being presented. So I would guess that my father was at a charity event every single week of his life, except when he was on vacation. And he would probably, if they had an auction, be bidding from while we were on vacation. He just loved to support charities. So like, it's not a surprise that I would start a charity. I started raising money for charity when I was four years old, going door to door in Philadelphia in our apartment complex, um, asking people to donate uh, for Jerry Lewis's telethon. So it's at the core of who I am. It's at the core of our family culture. I always knew that somehow this collection would be used charitably. I really wanted to open a museum in a very underserved part of a town where I live. And I approached my dad with that idea of opening a museum with so many of these incredible works, very much um, in line with the way the Barnes Foundation teaches and is hung. I felt like we could bring the Barnes to another part of, of the world. And he was so fiercely private and so fiercely humble that he couldn't even imagine that something so public would be done. Now it's 16 years later, and I've thought about this for, for a long time because he, he did not want the museum. So this touring of this collection for free and making it open so that people could really understand the breadth of it and the beauty of it really was important to me. So that was part of the giving back. And then also knowing that a portion of the funds would go to this very pivotal part of my life. I was not supposed to be here. I was supposed to be dead decades ago um, from stage four cancer and got this miracle of, of not passing away when they had already counted how long my life expectancy was. So I didn't have the opportunity to really go deep down into some of the things that Colleen was talking about. That's why it's so important to me that this webinar have this story starter for you, that you really can go to any of these experts here, whether it's Freeman's or it's the fine art group or a combination of both, and really start exploring how you could use the legacy of what your your generation ahead of you collected, or if you are that collector and you do have the next generation under you, how you can start these conversations so that it it all isn't done without a roadmap. So I am really a student of this. I'm really interested in donor advised funds. I'm interested in charitable bequests. I'm interested in a uh, trust and estates trust fund for my for my daughter. So I feel that this seminar, you know, we use my family and this collection just as a way to show you into this world. But I really hope that no matter what it is, even if it's one thing that your generation ahead of you has, or you want to give down to the next generation, that you really investigate, are they willing to be responsible for it? And is there money to maintain it? And, and if they don't want to allocate the time and energy to maintaining it, that it is then brought to market with this legacy concept or with your wishes um, being expressed. I know that my father would have loved how we're doing this. He would have loved the humility in how these exhibitions are traveling, how tastefully uh, Freeman's is put together, 
the three components that really express who he was. He loved Philadelphia. He had such a joie de vivre. He had such a passion for life. And he was so curious and so adventurous. And we've really made that come to life in the way this collection is not only being viewed, but toured and the memory that's being presented for all times for people to research and have these beautiful essays and the provenances of these pieces. And he was ahead of his time. And I think the way that we're doing this, even though it is a single, single owner sale, the response that the art world is giving back to me privately is that, wow, this is really breaking the mold of single owner sales. It is so clear that Freeman's and the Fine Art Group are so incredibly passionate about this sale and about works that haven't been seen for 20 to 80 years. I mean, just under 80 years. My dad started collecting in his 20s. He would be 100 now. So I love that I get to do this. I am so charitably focused. As I said, I run the Comedy Cures Foundation, and we've collaborated with over a thousand different organizations. So the fact that I know that I'm not going to be locked in to just supporting my charity, but that I can use the proceeds, the pro portion of the proceeds that are coming from this sale to do what my father did, which is spread his philanthropy, spread his support, and really give um, voice to people that normally wouldn't be given voice in a certain way. I was allowed to do two research studies. I'm not a scientist, but I surrounded myself with them. And those two um, scientific studies produce groundbreaking results to improve the lives of cancer patients. So I am excited that you look at this. I hope that there's something that speaks to you that you want to bid, but at least go and share in the brilliance of, of my father and his collection and the passion of all the experts that have surrounded this to make the art world stand up and pay attention, not only to his remarkable eye, his passion, his curiosity, but as Alistair said, how he happened to pick these inflection points when artists were starting movements or becoming the great people that they were considered in the art world. He loved those moments of experimentation. So please just enjoy, indulge, wrap yourself in this collection and learn so much. Thank you so much, Saren. And now let's get down to the specifics around this collection. Can you go to the next slide, please? So Al, take us through, how do we bid? Where do we look at the, where can we look at the catalog? Give us the dates, tell us what we need to know. Sure, as, as we're speaking, they're busy downstairs in the gallery, hanging, it looks amazing, I have to say. We've got the opening night party on Thursday, uh, and then we go and view to the, the, the public the day after. The first sale, there are two sales. Part one is on February the 27th at 12 p.m. Part two, February the 28th, the next day. And that will be all be happening at 2400 Market Street, where I am just now. We're very excited about it. There are various ways that you can bid. Um, go to our website, www.freemansauction.com, or you can go to that little QR thing, and that'll tell you lots as well. And um, you can contact me or contact one of the other specialists. We can walk you through the whole process. Uh, it's very easily done. You shouldn't be intimidated by auction. It's, it's become an incredibly popular way to acquire art and to build up a collection. Uh, you can leave bids. You can bid by telephone. You can bid through the Freeman's portal online. So many different ways to do it. We'll, we'll sort you out. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. This concludes our webinar, Creating a Legacy, the collection of Sydney Rothberg. Um, we would very much uh, like to assist you at any time with your legacy as it relates to your art and collectibles. The Fine Art Group is here to serve. In addition, we want to thank Freemans and their specialists for putting together such a beautiful sale. Um, they really are experts at single owner sales. Lastly, we want to thank Saren Rothberg. Um, thank you for sharing your collection with us 
and the world of collectors. And I would also like to mention that she has announced that the American Association of Cancer Research will be the first recipient um, of some of the proceeds of this sale. Of course, there'll be other organizations after this. And lastly, um, we encourage you to share this webinar with your friends and colleagues and anyone else who may be interested in thinking strategically around their collections. Have a wonderful day.